Welcome back. This is episode 8 of the Going for Broke Outdoors podcast, a podcast by an outdoorsman for other outdoorsmen. I'm your host, Jeremy Gillespie. In today's episode, we welcome Eric Birkentine. Eric is a lifelong bow hunter, a forester, and a wildland firefighter by trade. In this episode, we explore the unique marriage between Eric's experience as a bow hunter and as a wildland fire crew boss. Eric's year-round experiences and observations in the field have resulted in Eric possessing an expert-level knowledge of wind and weather patterns. In today's episode, we discuss wind and thermals, beginning at the macro level, and as the podcast progresses, we dive into some deep detail on the mechanics that drive wind and thermals in a micro-environment. Eric does a great job providing examples from his own hunting experience and suggests factors for hunters to consider as they seek to better understand the dynamics of wind and thermals. On an unrelated note, I've received a lot of questions about why the podcast is hosted on YouTube and not other major sites like iTunes or Stitcher, etc. The short answer is YouTube is free and most of the other hosting sites charge a fee. So if you're listening to this podcast and you'd like to see it hosted on other platforms, you can help me by subscribing to this YouTube channel, sharing the podcast with a friend, or making a donation towards hosting fees using the link in the video description below. If and when the regular audience grows a little larger, I'll pony up the cash to host on all these other platforms. In the meantime, the podcast will continue to be hosted here on YouTube. Hope everyone understands. But before we get started, guys, if you haven't already stopped by Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com to outfit your mobile hunting setup with some silencing gear, you're really missing out. The off-season is the perfect time to upgrade your mobile hunting setup. There's not a better product on the market for eliminating unwanted noise. Stealth Outdoors manufactures an incredibly durable product for a great value. Designed from the ground up with the mobile hunter in mind, Stealth Outdoors manufactures climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, and stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs. Speaking of mobile hunting setups, consider upgrading yours with a set of stick talons from mobilehuntinggear.com. Stick talons offer a way to securely fasten most popular climbing sticks to a variety of mobile tree stands and now saddle platforms as well. Not only do the stick talons provide secure climbing stick transport to and from your hunting location, they also aid at the tree setups by keeping your climbing sticks organized and quiet on your stand while you're ascending the tree. Stick talons are the solution to a one trip up the tree setup. MobileHuntingGear.com also offers customized solutions for just about any mobile setup. Reach out to MobileHuntingGear.com for a customized quote. Now, on to the podcast. All right, on the phone today, I have Eric Birkentine. Eric, you recently had a popular thread on the Hunting Beast Forum discussing wind and thermals. I took a lot away from that thread, but I also ended up with a few more questions, so I reached out to you and you agreed to come on the podcast Today, I want to dive deeper into those topics. However, before we get into that discussion, let's learn a little more about you for the people who aren't familiar with you. So, first of all, how are you doing today, Eric? I'm doing great, man. I'm really excited to be talking to you today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, glad to have you. So, for people that don't know, let's start out with, uh, where do you live? I live in Delaware. I live in the southeastern part kind of along the coast. Delaware is not a really big state. It's only three counties and probably about 98 miles from the north to the south. Um, I grew up in the northern part of the state before it got overdeveloped. And, and, um, and you know, I spent some time in, you know, in living in other states. I lived in the Adirondacks in New York for a while, um, came home for a little while, lived in West Virginia for a little while, and then um, kind of figured the only way I'd come back to my home state was if I could be um, down in the southern part it's a lot more rural so it's like it, it's kind of odd where I live now because there's a lot of beach resort communities um but if you go inland a little bit it's it's about 50 percent agriculture and 50 percent forested real flat ground uh like I think it you know I would equate it to like the coastal plain of Georgia I'd say but um, have the Delaware Bay to my east, and then that kind of separates Delaware and New Jersey, and then the Atlantic Ocean, you know, on the coast there down and, you know, cleared down to Maryland. No, and I've been down here for um, uh, about 21 years now when I finally relocated back to to the state. But one thing I will say about Delaware is it's really different from the north to the south. Down where I'm at, you can equate it more to, like I said, kind of southern condition. Our primary timber species is like loblolly pines. So there's a lot of wetlands. There's a lot of pine plantations. 
Um, whereas the northern parts like Piedmont, it's like a lot more rolling hills and really big hardwoods and just it's like it's really abrupt. The way I try to explain it to people like from you know, with my career and stuff like that, like with trees, like you have the northernmost species in their southernmost range and then and then where I'm at, it's like the southern species in their northernmost range. So it's kind of it, it's it's a really unique place for being such a small state. So, yeah, you mentioned a lot of tree species there and your career. So that's a good segue into the next question. If you could tell everyone what you do for a living and how does your career translate into such an in-depth knowledge of the wind, which is what we're going to talk about primarily today. Yeah. And I guess like it, it would kind of roll into a little bit more. It's not so much just like, you know, wind, but more so just being, you know, in the, in the, in an environment, like in the outdoors. So just to kind of like segue into that, I was really fortunate as a kid to grow up and, you know, and basically have free reign in the woods. I was the kind of kid that got to run around with a one longer 20 gauge when I was 10 years old and, you know, got a 22 when I was 12 and I was constantly just, you know, shooting squirrels and, you know, groundhogs and birds and you name it, you know, it was, um, but I, I really spent all my time in the woods as a kid. And also another big thing was I was really into archery from a super, super young age. So all through, you know, through my youth and through high school, I was always hunting and fishing. You know, my family was kind of into it. My dad didn't hunt anymore. I was pretty much self-taught in that, in that realm. But uh, I just developed this, like, this love for the woods. And I think, like, I didn't really worry about it too much. Like, academics wasn't much of my thing in high school, I guess. And I started looking around afterwards to see what I wanted to do, you know, go to school for. I didn't want to go to college. And I was looking at environmental science. And my mom and I took a ride up to this uh, really cool school up in northern New York called Paul Smith College. And they had a forest technicians program. And that was kind of something more that I was into. Uh, you know, you're in the woods and you're learning how to harvest timber and run a sawmill and learn all these different things about forestry, like technical forestry. And that, that kind of equated into a lot of my love. Like, I think my goal as a kid was to try to find a career where I could get paid to walk around in the woods. And I think I got, once I got on the path like i got pretty dead set on it and things got a lot more serious so i went to forestry school um i got one degree and then actually it was just an associate's degree as a forest technician and then uh and that really gave me a background because as a kid i always wanted to really understand like the environment like being in the woods is one thing but knowing what trees what and why it's there and what soils it grows in and, and the kind of pl other plants it's associated with and the and slopes and aspects and all that different stuff like you know, I was really wanting to get dialed in on things like that. Um, college, I started reading a lot, like um, really like Aldo Leopold, like Sand Candy Almanac, if you've never had a chance to read that book. Like he was kind of inspirational to me at a young age. Like, and he was cool because he was a forester and he developed like modern wildlife management. He was also into bow hunting, all kinds of stuff like that. But I was actually, after I got my first degree, I was actually a logger. So I was falling timber for like a few years to save money up to go back to school and finish up my forestry degrees. So I was like working in Southeast PA and Northern Delaware, cutting like, you know, really large Eastern hardwoods. Like I was a faller and, um, you know, cutting 40, 50 inch yellow poplar and oak all day long, you know, 120 feet tall and just massive trees, 40, 50 inches in diameter. So I got really, you know, I got really proficient in, in that. I got back into school and I got, my degree in forest resource management from West Virginia University. Lived in Morgantown for a while, kind of worked when I was there. And then um, I was working on my master's degree and I was like 24, 25 at the time. I was just kind of sick, sick of being in school and living off of like $250 a week. And a job came up with the, with the forest service the, um, in, in my home state in Delaware. And, uh, and I interviewed for that job and, and got it. And then I moved down here into Southern Delaware. And then uh, the state had a fire crew that traveled all over the U.S. And um, right away, I that kind of coincided really well with that skill set I had to be, you know, my logging background and then my background in forestry and, and all that knowledge you kind of get from learning all about the different things. Like foresters are kind of, it's kind of a cool thing, um, like a, a jack of all trades, but master of none kind of thing when you're 
you just you just get this background in it and everything you can think of from soils and water and, and the trees and, and entomology and pathology and in wildlife management and all that so having all that knowledge and then you know translating over into fire i started spending parts of my summer um on the fire crew and i started out as a as a sawyer on the crew and then started traveling all over the u.s and i kind of you know progressed and i and now i'm 21 years into it um i'm 46 now and uh through experience and you know the willingness to take on that you know different responsibilities um I, I'm now the crew boss and I run that 20 person crew. So in turn with my job at home, not just being a forester, I actually, I actually manage a, a pretty large tract of state forest land down here. And then I also do a lot of fire management, which fighting fire and fire management, you know, kind of two different things. The fire management parts like deals more with prescribed fire. So with my fire background, you know, traveling all over the country, even in Alaska and spent a lot of time in places like California and Oregon, Washington, Idaho, all kinds of, you know, pretty much every Western state, you start getting into these different areas and de- dealing with all these different fuel types and different terrain and that experience and, and that knowledge you gain over that time. Like um, you start learning about how, how things operate in that landscape. Obviously the biggest thing is how fire travels through that landscape and like, because I'm out there fighting it and I'm, and and we're trying to plan on how we can do things based on, you know, current and expected weather and fire behavior and the topography is like a really big thing. And you're doing that, you know, because you're 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 finding yourself in a place where like you're setting trigger points because you're trying to calculate like how fire is going to travel across the landscape, where it's going to get to at a certain amount of time. You know, a lot of that has to just do with the safety of my crew and like the tactics that we're going to use, you know, to try to, to extinguish the fire. And you now with the fire management aspect of it, like I'm constantly monitoring conditions, like when I can go out and, and, and light fire, you know, to set fire to things purposefully as a resource tool to manage the landscape. You know, we'll set objectives on what we want to do. It might be we just might want to eliminate a lot of fuel in the woods so it reduces wildfire hazard or we're burning for a particular plant or, uh, you know, wildlife that prefers like, you know, certain conditions. So you're constantly checking wind, humidities, like getting way into weather, like you pretty much like geek out on it and all those different factors that are, that are combined in there. Like it gives you an idea. You have to have an idea and a prescription written like prior to lighting a prescribed fire to, to and, and kind of see how it's going to work into the landscape to kind of like what the result of it's going to be the fire ecology um it, it's it's just a you know it's it's a lot like it but it's it's taken me 20 some years to finally get to the point where i can feel comfortable and talk to you about it and hopefully like you know pass some that knowledge on but that's just a little background like of how i got into this and how i got such a intimate knowledge of of, of wind and thermals and and topography and all these different things it's I mean, it's necessary for safety and it is necessary for just, you have to have that understanding and in, in that, in that certain career and kind of everybody does, you know, it's kind of unwritten rule, but you know, when you're, when you're younger on the crew, you're just taking orders. And then when you're actually in a position where you're like making decisions later on, you pretty much have to be pretty squared away with that kind of stuff, you know? So that's just a, you know, a nutshell. It seems like a lot, but it's just a nutshell of this stuff. I, you know, I had to kind of experience in order to be able to, you know, kind of translate all this for you guys here today. So that's a great background. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously over the course of 21 years in that profession, you've gained a lot of experience and expertise. And like you said, wind behavior and different types of trains and topography so that's one of the main things we're going to talk about today and you're also you're also an avid deer hunter correct oh yeah yeah like it, you know kind of talking about what it was like when i was a kid like uh give you a little background with that like my grandpa was really in the archery like even back in the like in the 50s like late 40s early 50s he was like kind of like an early advocate probably watched errol flynn in a robin hood movie or something like that and and then Fred Bear was huge back then, and um, he actually started an archery club in southern New Jersey and called Abiskwisoy Archers, and it's in, like, Alloway, New Jersey. My my brother still lives pretty close to it, 
and he was like really really into it and my dad shot with him and my uncles and and a lot of their a lot of friends they'd get together and they basically had this field archery club well my grandpa died before i was born my dad you know he didn't hunt much you know when i was a kid really at all when i was a kid but we had all this archery equipment in my basement we had all these really awesome like you know bows that my grandpa made or had made and had this really cool you know i still have his 58 um bear kodiak special which is i i still shoot it sometimes it's it's awesome but we had all these he made all his own arrows and he made all his own feathers and and he he deer hunted back then and my dad used to just tell me a lot of stories so i just romanticized kind of about it in my head and i was always making bows and stuff like that when i was a kid um but always still like hunting too i was always shooting a gun or doing whatever but i loved boat bows and arrows um probably when i was about like 10 years old um my mom took me over to the archery shop and you know i got a compound bow and then i started shooting leagues like every sunday or like every saturday morning and i shot competitively from like the time i was like 10 years old up until like you know late teens or maybe even early 20s and i and then i ended up working at the same archery shop from the time i was like 13 until i was like 21 probably fletched like ten thousand dozen arrows in my lifetime i don't even know man it's, <laughs> it's crazy but you know and then i and then got in on the early wave of like 3d and stuff like that so i was always shooting a bow but i had one cousin in particular that really got into it too and especially when we were in high school and we just started deer hunting like a lot more with archery tackle and he lived in a really cool like wooded area and it was like a pro it was like kind of like a private neighborhood and it was almost like urban hunting and we could and it was funny then because we were hunting deer on the ground wearing like you know flannel shirts and blue jeans like and killing does like hiding behind bushes and stuff it was really fun yeah um it's funny now looking back at it like how sometimes how like with the equipment and all the cool stuff out there like how we kind of overcomplicate it sometimes and you look back and i remember too like uh my uncle one of my uncles who i'm really close with he was only 10 years older than me like one of the coolest things was is when he you know he was in the marines and he used to give us his old camis and like that was my first set of camo like it was awesome but yeah i really got into deer hunting like especially like in high school my my cousin passed actually he 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 passed away when he was like 20 years old so i kind of took a break for a little while kind of messed me up a little bit i kind of got out of it for a little while um and kind of focused on other stuff i really like art i really like music i've been playing guitar for like 35 years so i kind of you know i was always fishing or i was still doing some sort of hunting i could have been bird hunting or doing whatever but when i moved back down here is once i started picking back up with it again and really really like focusing a lot of time and energy into it and but it's kind of being a hunter and then like pretty much deer hunting like it was really funny like i I actually killed my first deer my first buck with a gun two years ago that was the first first year i ever killed with a gun other than having to euthanize one like you know it it work or something like that but i i've been that like dedicated to archery and bow hunting whether it be like with modern equipment or traditional equipment or whatever the last couple of years i've been hunting with trad equipment last year's really rad because i killed an awesome velvet buck with my recurve that was like you know that was like next level stuff like kind of like a bucket list thing for me yeah that's awesome man and then i joined i think i, I joined the hunting beast i think in like 2014 and um i think i found myself in the same place where a lot of people do like you're you're really into it but your success is like here and there and i was hunting public land obviously in this land this this ground that i hunt on is probably like the hardest thing i've ever done because it's just completely flat and you're you're trying to learn where these deer are and and it's it's tough um i think like a lot of people do i remember lockdown saying this a lot like he was talking about like you 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 have a tendency to hunt rut tactics, tactics a lot. You know, every field and stream magazine that came on, this is like kill the big buck, you know, and you're reading all this stuff and you find yourself reading all these articles. And I read a lot of stuff by like Everhart and, and they don't really tell you much, you know, they, it, it ends up being like a story. And then you find yourself in a place where you're like, you know, where do bucks bet? That's, that's what brought me to the hunting beast. And then I, I like Google it one day. And the next thing I know, they're like talking about buck beds. Yeah. So let me interrupt you right there. Cause that's a good transition into one of the other questions I had, which was, so you've obviously got this long and pretty deep background of bow hunting. You've got a, at this point now in your life, uh, you've said you've been doing 
forestry and fire management for about 21 years. So you joined the Hunting Beast when, 2014-ish? So about seven years ago? Yeah, yeah, yep. So it sounds like finding the Hunting Beast Forum kind of turned on a light bulb for you. It was like revolutionary. Like it, it was it was something where all of a sudden like everything that I'd previously done like kind of went out out the window. And, and, he, and, and at that point in time, I think he like when you start getting into it and you, it was weird, too, because like a lot of people find this and a lot of people express the same exact thing I'm going to express is that, you know, I, I first started like I got some of the videos and these are like or the DVDs and these are like the old blood blood brother ones that Dan was on. And I remember like watching those and I'm, the other two fellows on there, like you could tell like right away, like like they're OK, but you could tell this 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 long long haired guy over here. He's like legit because everything he says, he says with confidence and he's like and he's so sure of himself. And they're hunting different terrain. They're hunting and you know, the marshes for me were, were I mean, that was something I could get into because that's something we have around here. Hills, I was like, I don't know. But what was really funny is like I started, even though like we may only have a five or 10 foot elevation change or something like that here, I, I started approaching things on a, like a micro level compared to like the macro level. And it still all works the same. It's just you're trying to find stuff on a much smaller scale. And then, you know, I remember finding like my first beds and starting to figure things out. And then I knocked down like a really good buck. Like it was a weird deer. It was only like a six pointer. It didn't even have any brow times, but it dressed out at like 205. And I killed it early season. He was like right, you know, end of September. And I remember having scouted and, and starting to really learn and just learning how to pick apart things. And then having that background that I had. And then with him talking about the wind and then him talking about the thermals and how they're going to, how they're going to bed in a certain spot, because it's going to favor, you know, a lot of the places I hunt, they, they can't see. So they're using their eyes and, and, and nose, nose, especially. So you start figuring stuff out where like every place where these bucks are bedded is like the thermals are dropping right in their bed every evening in a low spot or near water or doing, you know, or bedding on a hummock, like out in the middle of the area of flooded timber. And, like I just started developing all these nuances and just reading all the stuff on the beast. Like in 2014, it was, it was a little different because a lot of these topics that, that you were familiar with and I'm familiar with and a lot of, you know, guys on there that are really experienced and really good hunters, that was stuff like then that was like, it was like new to us, you know, and people were kind of on that same discovery you know journey of discovery in that sense where they're like you know they're going out and they're finding these things and everybody's i think people find it a little easier but you're still like to, to find that information it's it's definitely there but that was such a huge transition is is finding the beast and just you know kind of becoming it, it's almost like becoming like a disciple of a completely different thing because you're you're automatically you're automatically putting in yourself in a place where you're like you're marginalizing yourself because and everybody talks about this too. You can't talk to anybody about deer hunting anymore. <laughs> like that, yeah. that, like 95% of the people that deer hunt. Cause around here, you know, guys are sitting in box stands and they're hunting over corn piles, you know, on field edges. And everybody is like, Oh, you don't want to hunt public land. You'll get shot on there, you know? And I'm like, fine. And still to this day, like still to this day, I, I rarely even run into people like, you know, our, Delaware is a cool state because our, our season opener is September 1st. And the season goes till January 31st and you can bow hunt all through all the gun seasons. We have like an October muzzle loader. We have a November shotgun. And then we, in the month of January, we have a pistol season, a shotgun season and a muzzle loader season again. And, and by the time like Thanksgiving or Christmas rolls around, like just everybody's out, out of the woods, you know? Yeah. The gun seasons around here are crazy because we get tons of people that come down from Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, we definitely have a, a pretty stout orange army. But I, I still, you know, I find that to be pretty cool for me because a lot of those people are very, you know, they don't push back far, um, you know, puts the deer back in those areas where I'm not afraid to get to. And I, I kind of enjoy it. I don't mind wearing orange when I'm bow hunting. I just, my biggest fear is somebody seeing where I'm sitting. Right. <laughs> you so, know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's back up just slightly. So obviously yep. you, you have the background we talked about, wind, topography, the thermals and that's what i want to go over today so for guys that aren't familiar that's the whole reason i want to have you on because i want to have a more in-depth conversation about that so let's start with the absolute basics here because 
I've seen enough confusion on this topic and it's worth clarification. So let's just go ahead uh, and, and start with the absolute basics and then we're going to get into more complex topics. So let's start out and I just want you to define wind direction for, you know, for guys that absolutely, again, starting from the absolute basics. Yeah. So wind direction is pretty easy. So just everybody needs to remember it's the, it's the direction the wind is coming from. So if you're looking at a, you know, if you're familiar with the compass, you know, north, south, east, west, or whatever, it's actually, it's, it, if you were to stand with the wind in your face and you took a compass wherever the needle's pointing to, the, the direction it's coming from, that's that's what you define as, as your wind direction. A lot of people think it's the opposite, where it's blowing to, you know? Right. Like if it's a west wind, it's blowing to the east, they'll say it's an east wind, but it's actually, it's a west wind. Right. The direction of origination. Yep. Yeah. The direction of origin. Correct. Yep. All right. Well, good. I think we, we won't spend too much time in that because uh, that's a basic concept, but it is worth mentioning if, if someone's new. One of the other things I want to move on to is big picture elements that impact wind behavior. And specifically, I'd like you to discuss low pressure and high pressure systems. And what can you tell me about how low pressure systems and high pressure systems influence macro wind patterns? Yeah. So this is kind of cool. Like if anybody's, you know, I'm sure people sometimes like they look at, you know, they see the weather, they go on a weather map or like an overall one of like, I'd say the country, because we're, this is more of a macro thing. Like when you're talking about these pressure systems and how they work, like, so if you look at a weather map, you'll see like somebody will say there's a storm moving across the U S and, and you'll see on the map, you'll see like a big L. And then you'll see all these little lines like around the L. And if people don't know what those lines are, they're called isobars. And basically, when you look at a map and you see those lines on there, the isobars, when you when they're spread far apart, like on, over a grand scale, the winds are pretty light. When you look at the isobars, the tighter the isobars get, the higher the wind speeds. So if you see a low pressure, you know, coming up, like for for me, like I'll, I'll just kind of equate it, like a lot of our our storms like they our low pressures come up like the Tennessee Valley and like kind of up the East Coast and we end up getting a nor'easter and it sits like off like up over the North Atlantic and and the other and just kind of spins around and just gives us a bunch of wet weather. The other thing with low pressure systems too is they're always equated with moisture. So when you get a low, you know, there's usually going to be rain or snow or whatever, depending upon, you know, what part of the country you're in, what your temperatures are, the time of the year or whatever. What's interesting about a low pressure system is like it, it develops actually like on the equator. So that's where the sun hits the earth in the strongest, right? Makes sense. So the sun's beating down on the equator. It's drawing moisture from the ocean, from whatever. And what low pressure systems do is they actually, they pull moisture in and they pull wind, like they, they pull air currents into them or wind into them. So you get like inflows into that system. So the pressure, basically the pressure is lower, like the center of the low, low pressure system, the pressure is lower than everything around it. It draws in air, that air that it brings in is warm air. So one thing that's, one thing about air is this, warmer air holds more moisture. It can hold tons more moisture. So that's when our humidities go up, everything goes up. So what happens is, these low pressure systems draw in all this moisture they pull they pull it inward and the other thing about them too is what's interesting about them is they rotate they rotate counterclockwise so that's why we end up having like east winds or northeast winds kind of associated with a low pressure system at least in my area that we 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 get nor'easters where i'm from I, I don't know what they call them out there i know they have weather patterns but they a lot of it has to do out there with the mount with the with the mountain ranges and the systems and stuff like that and how the weather you know it works on the east side compared to the west side or whatever you know there's there's a lot of that that goes on out there but so what happens is is this all this moisture and this warm air gets pulled in and it hits, it goes up into the upper atmosphere and it hits, a, it hits the dew point. So what a dew point is, is it's kind of like the level in the atmosphere where it, the air cools down and the water starts to condense. So when you get in the upper level atmosphere, basically 
when the temperatures get colder and the air gets colder, the, ca- the air, cold air can't hold water. So we said warm air can hold a lot of water, but cold air really can't. So once it gets up and hits the dew point, the water starts to, or all the moisture in the air starts to form condensation. You get clouds. That's why we always get, it's always overcast and, and rainy or whatever during the low pressure. All those water molecules are up hanging out in the upper atmosphere. They start banging around each other. They get heavier. And then next thing you know, you have rain, you have snow, whatever. So those lows are always bringing moisture. And that's kind of how they work. How I equate that, like when I think about it in deer hunting, like, I, you know, I never have, I don't know about you, man. I, I never had much luck, like during those times, it's kind of like still it's the winds are, you know, if you get snow or you get something like that, it's, it's one thing, but you know, it always brings rain. Uh, for us, it's, it's generally brings like southerly winds when it first start the Southeast kind of winds until that low pressure starts like traveling up the coast and then coming onshore, we get a lot of onshore flow, you know, coming from the ocean or whatever, where I'm at. And it, it, it just, I don't know, man, it's not quite right. And, and you've probably heard, probably heard like a lot of people know that like, they talk about high pressure days and how good they are for deer hunting, especially like colder days, like during the rut. Um, when you have a good high pressure day, like you, a lot of times you see a lot better, like, you know, movement or rutting activity or chasing activity, I should say. Yeah. That's definitely been my experience. I prefer the high pressure days for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have very, I, I don't have really good, I've never had really good luck. I mean, there's many times where I sat in the rain or did whatever, if it's raining late season, I'm going duck hunting. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not right. hunting. I just, yeah, it's duck weather at that point in time, but transitioning from that low pressure system into the high pressure system. So, so air, air, air always wants to move from high pressure to low pressure. So when you look at that weather map and you see that L right behind it, you're almost always going to see an H and there's a, like a front in between the two of them. So that low pressure is turning counterclockwise and the adverse of that is, is the high pressure turns clockwise where those two kind of, one of those two boundary boundaries meet, that's where you'll see, like I talked about those ISO bars, that's where you're seeing, you, they'll get real tight because you're having a shift in wind. So you're, you're having a lot of like turbulent winds in between those, in between those two systems. So what's interesting about higher pressure is the winds, they, they blow away from the high pressure. So that's where you get kind of the adverse and you get like that frontal passage. And when it, when a front develops, like a weather front develops, usually what happens is the wind, you know, starts from the south or southeast or whatever. And as that front passes, the wind switches around. It'll, it'll a lot of times clock around like counterclockwise and the wind will switch 180 degrees. So it would be like from a, like a Southeast to a Northwest. And you always notice like high pressure systems are usually equated with a North wind or a Northwest wind. They're colder. It's a drier, colder air mass. Doesn't hold any moisture. Cause we always said, we already said that cooler air doesn't hold much moisture. Um, we get those lower, lower temperatures, the sun's out, bluebird days, blue sky, very few clouds. But what's interesting about those systems is that, like I said, those highs always come in be- behind the lows because the high pressure basically, it wants to kind of sink. That air wants to sink. The high pressures, I said they're blowing air out. So instead of that air column, like when we're talking about the low rising, since it's cooler air, it's dropping. So it's actually like filling the hole in back behind the low pressure. So you're, you're basically like you have this cycle and there's these cycles happen, you know, globally all the time. So it's just, if you kind of remember like the low pressures are bringing moisture and then, and then the high pressures are not, and they're bringing cooler air and they're bringing, you know, cooler temperatures and uh, a lot more steady wind. We get high pressures in the summertime that just, you know, they just blow crazy warm air for out of the Southwest forever. But, you know, it's definitely when that frontal passage happens and how I can kind of relate it and give you a great example of how this could work for you. So we talk, when we're talking about buck betting and we have say a low pressure coming through, well, if your bucks are betting wind-based, you know, they're in their spots where like, especially if you're like in hill country, you, your leeward sides of the hills are going to change completely. They're going to go 180. So they'll be on one side of the ridge one day and once the front passes, they'll be on the other side of the ridge the next day. You know what I mean? 
Yep. So you can kind of see, like, if you can see those weather systems moving through from like a, from like a pre-planning kind of standpoint, like if you're sitting there and you're at the beginning of the week and you're like, Hey, I'm going to hunt these days or whatever, this high pressure system's coming through while well, these winds are going to switch. One thing I've already, like, they always say, like, try to get on the front end of those high pressures or the back ends of the lows. I think, it, I think you see a lot of deer moving because there's, they're kind of having to get up and, and, and switch their bedding, you know, it, to, to suit the, the opposite wind direction. I mean, does that, does that make sense? I don't know. It makes, makes a lot of sense. I mean, why wouldn't that be the case? Definitely, you know, people are, I, I think, like, especially during the rut, you're seeing a lot more deer, deer killed on these, like, on these high-pressure bluebird days, you know, steady winds, cooler temperatures, and the cooler temperatures are, all, are also going to bring a lot more movement. And especially since we talked about low pressures, those systems with the moisture being warmer, having warmer air, like, there's nothing worse than, like, a warm rut. And we've had terrible ones. The past few years here have been really bad, like, when we're sitting in the 50s and 60s and sometimes even in the 70s into November. And the buck I killed this year was November 2nd, and it was right after we had a huge low pressure system. It was the first morning, and it was clear as a bell out, and the temperatures were 30 degrees difference from what they had been, you know, previously. I was I was in the rain, like, and in, in the, you know, really high humidity um, those, those couple days leading up to that. And I actually scouted and found that buck, like in, on a really rainy day, I was able to go into the area and just tear the whole place apart and not really worry about it. But that first clear day we got, it was like four or five days after it was like they, they, as soon as I walked into the woods, I saw deer, you know, it was like, they were up and moving. Yeah. Those are the kind of days you dream about in November. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now that we've discussed high and low pressure, let's move on to some more definitions kind of and this was part of your thread that you'd posted on the beast and the first one i want to have you discuss is what do you define as a general wind that's the one that's caused by those high and low pressure systems coming through you know it'd be more of a general you know the wind's going to be coming out of the south or whatever when there's a low pressure system or or you know and then you know once that front front passes and the high pressure's behind it you know you're gonna have northwest winds so that's like that's pretty, that's steady. That's something you can rely on. You can accurately predict. There's nothing that's going to vary that, you know, there's nothing else that's going to influence that. So that's like more of a general, general wind. Okay. So if we're starting from big picture to micro environment, general wind is at the top and that's generated from either a high or low pressure system. Correct. Okay. All right. So let's move down, which would be like the next layer below the top layer. And on the hunting beast wind thread, you also discussed what you called local winds and defined those winds as, in a quote, winds which are generated over a comparatively small area by local terrain and weather. They differ from those which would be appropriate to general pressure patterns. Can you give me a specific example of what type of local terrain and weather and, and how those might influence winds relative to the general wind in the area? Yeah. So things that are going to be more of a local wind um, influence are going to be like, especially when you're in terrain, like you have mountains or you have certain topographic features that are going to channel wind in a certain direction. They're going to cause it to swirl or do kind of wacky things, you know, outside of that, that big picture wind. Say you have a, a valley that's, you know, running perpendicular to the general wind direction or something like that. Well, you may have, um, and, and then you may have like drainages or something that are coming like out of a valley or a stream bottom or something like that, where that are going to actually like funnel that wind. It could be something as, as simple as a power line, like a big high tension power line cut, you know, a big swath like cut over a ridge and, 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 the, and dipping down, you know, in the lower elevation and going up another rig or whatever the, all those types of things are going to funnel wind and even something as, as simple as like one of the things that i deal with a lot here is a lot of rolling out of the wind where like i'll be hunting say like i'll know there's a good bedding area in a pine plantation and the trees aren't very tall but i'm hunting on the edge where there's mature timber and like that wind might be coming i know what my what my big picture wind is but when it's intercepting like those two different canopy heights it's doing all kinds of crazy stuff it's like it's it's swirling it's rolling it's it's i've had i i really good example it's tough for me because being on the flat ground like 
I, I'm, de- I'm dealing with transitions a lot. And a lot of those transitions involves like, it, it, it involves like, you know, different stand types. Like, so I might have mature woods on one side and might have a marsh on the other side or, or a small pine plantation or something like that, that I'm hunting off the edge of it, like an old clear cut or whatever. And I remember one time I specifically scouted a spot out that where it was kind of, it was late season, you know, the deer were getting back on like a good pattern. I found a little spot. With, we have these, what's called water oak and they, and they kind of hold on to their acorns like later in the season. They're like a red oak species, but they're really, it's a really bitter acorn. It has like a lot of tannic acid in it. it it's one of those things that the deer would much rather get into much later in the season. Cause we have so many ag fields around, you know, they're eating, you know, they're eating spoiled grain out in the fields like beans or corn or whatever till pretty late in the season. But um, it was cold. We had snow. I saw these acorns. I saw like, you know, a lot of deer sign around them. Well, it was kind of like a, it was kind of like a little patch of like scrubby, scrubby trees that weren't very tall, but then it butted up right next to a stand of like really mature loblollies that were, you know, 70, 80 feet tall, much bigger diameter. I had the wind right in my face and it was kind of cutting crossways across the trail that I expected the deer to exit out of. And I knew where the bedding was and it was kind of like to my right and kind of far back. But here I am, I'm like, every time that wind would gust, when I would drop milkweed, it would, it would all of a sudden, like it would go behind me like 20 yards and then hook a complete 90 degree angle and then swirl all the way back around into the bedding area. And that's a result of those different height canopies. It was just the the result of the different heights of the canopy. And it, it was so, it was, you know, that's an aha moment because you're like, Oh great. Well, no wonder they're bedded here, you know? And then it was another thing where it's like, I might as well just get down now because <laughs> I'm done. What do you do? So let's say you scout an area in the spring and you identify that that could potentially be an issue. What do you do going forward to, to mitigate that problem? I don't know. Cause some of those times, some of those places, like, you know, obviously you know, all that scouting you do and then like interpretation that you do and what you think might happen, like all those elements might not be in place at that point in time when you're scouting and, and, and trying to put a plan together or pick out a tree or do whatever, you know, obviously sign's going to dictate whether or not I'm going to hunt there in the first place, but you make your best educated guess based on your experience of what you're dealing with, what wind direction you think you're going to hunt it on. There's been days where I just, I wanted to hunt a spot specifically, but I might have to loop around like a mile and come in from the opposite direction, not even have a a specific tree or an area picked out, but just something to get close to the bedding. I, I don't know. Like, I think, I think it, a lot of it's on the fly, but I think, I think when you're scouting and you're trying to pick out a spot and you're trying to wonder how it's going to work, I, I definitely, I definitely put that in my mind and I definitely have a pretty educated guess on what I think is going to happen based on my experience and, and what the winds have done in situations like that prior. It deserves a sit, but something as simple as just the, the milkweed is the, the most telling thing in the, in the world because it's just where I'm at. Like if I drop it, I can see it going 50, 60 yards in the woods and just with the lack of terrain that I have, it's really hard sometimes to pick out, you know, what I think it's going to do. But I definitely take all those things into consideration. And I definitely think like that has to do too with like just looking at the weather and seeing, you know, it seems like every place I hunt, like if I have a good steady wind, it's okay. And then every time it gusts, like something wacky happens. I think that's anywhere. When we're talking about local winds, so much of it is, is just influenced by the friction that, you know, the vegetation creates or the topography creates or whatever. Yeah, you know, remember it's all it's all gonna do crazy stuff just based on on the friction that vegetation and topography are creating. Like that's all it comes down to. Yeah, I just try to do the best I can. You know, nothing nothing is set in stone, not by a long shot. That's one of those things where it's uh for me, I know one of the things that I do is if I get into a hunting area where the wind is predictably different than what the forecasted one is. So let's say the general wind forecast is west and then I get into a hunting area and I know every time I get in there on a predicted west wind, it's actually north. There's a strong local wind influence there and that's something I'm going to take note of and and plan for on future hunts. I think I'd struggle with that more if I was like, you know, if you're like traveling out of state and you're getting into a new piece of ground that you've never been in before or something like that where you're not quite sure you know i i think if you're hunting like local places and you have like it was cool last night like last night i sat and watched like i think parts one and two of like 
Dan scouting workshop, the one that he just did a week or so ago. I don't know how long ago it was, but, you know, it was cool him walking everybody through the marsh and saying, hey, I've been hunting this place for 30 years. So when you have a, you know, when you have an intimate knowledge of a place like that, like you, you know, you can pretty much rely on all your experience at that point in time of what you think it's going to do. And I think like, I think just knowing your area and your, you like your local spots and stuff like that, that's something that's definitely a possibility for you, but it's, it's obviously going to take years to accumulate that kind of knowledge, you know, and, and, and make it so it's effective for you. Yeah, that's been a common theme from every guest I've had on so far is to learn whatever your primary hunting area or areas are as intimately as possible because there's there's really no replacement for for that in the field experience. No, no, not at all. Like you you can sit and you can sit and ponder and cyber scout and do whatever. It's all just, you know, all of those are just little pieces of the puzzle. It's just, you, you know, you don't really find out you know what happens until you get out there whether you're spot checking a place just to see if it's worth hunting because there's sign there or you sit and i mean there's been plenty of times where i just you know i got i was so sure like something was going to work out a certain way and then it didn't and then you're you're reluctant to even you know kind of move which later on you know i found out that's probably a pretty stupid thing to do is not just get up and move or or go somewhere else during the middle of the day if you're not seeing much i I've gotten a lot re- less reluctant to to do those kinds of things these days. But I think like, you know, if you're definitely observing something you think is going to be to your disadvantage, like it's time to rethink and kind of reevaluate what you're going to do and make a either a big move or a small move. I think that's what, I think that's what, you know, separates, you know, people that are successful, you know, from being unsuccessful. I'd agree for sure. So moving on, we talked about, the top layer which would be the general wind and then the next layer below would be the local wind and one of the types of local winds or something that can influence a local wind you also mentioned in the the hunting beast thread is a slope wind can you define a slope wind for the listeners and kind of the mechanics of how that works yep so slope winds are cool because they're they're pretty reliable outside of what the general winds are going to be and a lot of this has to do just with topography and a lot of it has to do also with something we'll touch on too which is like the orientation of slopes or or exposures basically what a slope wind is it's like a convective um wind that occurs and it's it's basically happens because of the heating and cooling of the of of an incline and for the non-meteorological types here like myself uh define convective a really good example of like of like convective heating It's just as simple as like steam rising from a cup of tea, you know, or a really cool example, like a really cool example would be like if you took, if you turn your, your tap water on and let it get really hot and just put it in a clear glass and just drop like a drop of like red food coloring in there, you'll see it it, in the glass. It'll just start swirling like crazy. It'll just start like mixing in there because of kind of the, the convective heat going on in there. This heating in the in the winds occur well they they, you have upslope and you have downslope so upslope winds occur when that slope it's exposed to the radiant heat of the sun so you have to understand aspect at that point in time or exposure aspect and exposure kind of they can be used the same so the aspect of a slope is i could just define it as a skier's view so if you're cruising down a hill like in your own skis and you're going down a hill, whatever, whatever direction you're facing, the general direction on a compass you're facing, that's the aspect of the slope. So a southerly aspect would actually be facing south, just as an example. To get into kind of like how it works and the time of day when it engages has to do with the position of the slope, like the, the aspect of the slope. So the sun rises in the east. The eastern exposures are going to get the first sun in the morning what's going to happen is all the cool air, you know, in the evenings, all the cool air drops down into those, like, if you want to look at a large scale valley or just a pocket, a lower pocket in the woods, like all that cold air is going to drop, just like your thermals are going to go drop like toward water. Everything's just going to go toward the lowest point. The, you, the cold air is going to drop into the lowest point. So the sun comes up in the east, starts heating, the eastern aspect, you might get enough exposure from the sun on that aspect in the morning to actually start heating up the ground, 
and causing a, like a warm air column or that convective heat to kick in and start carrying that cold air up, up slope and out. So your highest exposures that are going to get the most sun or your, your aspects that are going to get the most sun are going to be your southerly and your westerly because the sun's rotating around clockwise. So great example, like hunting in hill country, have a ridge running east west. You know, you get in there, you you want to hunt the leeward side. Well, first thing in the morning, all that cold air is still going to kind of be trapped, and and you're still you still might experience some downslope winds because all the cold air still might be dropping or completely settled down in the bottom somewhere. So you might have a little problem, you know, with your scent getting where you might not want it want to have it. So midday kind of rolls around and you start getting in the late morning and like later in the afternoon where the sun's beating down on that aspect, you're creating more convective heat. The ground is heating up and this happens too a lot quicker when the leaves are off, like in the fall, you know, cause you don't have a canopy like holding in anything. You're allowed all that radiant heat from the sun can directly hit the forest floor. So it'll, so it'll create that lift, that upslope wind. And those upslope winds are pretty, they're light. But if you have a, a northwest wind and you have a, a ridge running west east and your leeward side is the south facing, if you're having those upslope winds and then you're having that, you know, the northwesterly wind coming over the ridge, that's where we start getting into like the thermal tunnel and all that. But those thermal tunnels that you're running into, like on those upper third elevations um, where those deer cruise, that all has to do with those slope winds. So that's just the thermal, like we just talk about thermals rising up from the bottom. But what it actually is, it's just like convective heating that it's warm in the air and everything's just traveling up because warm air creates, you know, it's lift. It's just all lift. It's like no different than a hot air balloon. You're heating up the air in the balloon and it rises. Warm air is lighter. Cold air is heavier. That's why it falls, you know. So that's just, that's how slope winds work. So you have the upslope winds. And it's a, it's a diurnal cycle. And what that means is it just switches from night to, to daytime. It just switches 180 degrees. So when we're talking about the slope hitting certain aspects, we talked about like east, the east and north aspects are obviously going to, they're going to lose their sun exposure the quickest. So those downslope winds are going to occur a lot faster and earlier in the day. A good way to equate that is, is like, say if you have an east aspect Um, You have a westerly wind. You want to hunt the leeward side, which would be the east side, the east aspect of the slope. Well, do you want to set up above the trail or do you want to set up below the trail? Because you got to think, like, where's my scent going to? Is my scent going to drop across the trail if I'm too high? Because the sun's going to spin around. It's going to be more on the western aspect. And the the cooling air is already going to be dropping, which is going to be carrying my scent. So that's where you can, that's where the slope winds come into a lot of play. So that, that's how I would kind of equate it to a hunting scenario more than anything. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I think there's some really important takeaways for hunters there. And I just kind of want to recap those is that an east slope, that'll warm the earliest in the morning, followed by a south, then a west. Yep. The southern and westerly aspects are always going to get the most exposure. And then the down the downslope winds, you know, when everything starts dropping, is going to occur later in the day. The other thing I'd want to point out, too, from a vegetative standpoint, like especially when you're in ridges, like so north and east aspects will have different kinds of trees. It's, it's usually wetter on those aspects because the sun isn't drying out everything during the course of the day. And you'll have different and you'll have a lot lighter vegetation and like maybe different tree species like dry, trees that prefer drier tight soils, uh, you know, environment on the Western and Southern aspect, like vegetation favors those aspects as well. So you'll see a change in timber type, or you'll see, you know, that's why you see oaks in a lot drier places, see them higher up on the ridges. And then you start to see different types of trees down toward the, the, the bottoms. That's almost anywhere. I have that happen here with a five foot elevation change. Oaks are up on the higher drier sites, you know, maples, you know, poplar, sycamore, stuff like that down in a, more of an alluvial, like a flood bottom. That vegetation has a lot to do with it, too, and why it's placed on that over that landscape the way it is. And it has a lot to do with the aspect of the slope. Yeah. And these are really important things that you're mentioning. I want to go back to to something else you said was 
that a, a forest where leaf drop has already occurred, you know, you're going to get stronger slope winds there because you, you're you going to get more, more heat to the forest floor earlier. Yep. And your slope winds, again, are going to be stronger too. You know, the upslope winds during the day are always going to be more so, you know, they're going to have a, a, a higher influence again on the, like almost a faster speed. Like if you were to equate it to wind speed, you know, maybe on your east and north facing aspect, like if you're going to have any lift, it, it would be very minimal it, from a measurable standpoint. Like, but if you're looking at it from like, a south and west aspect like you might have two three mile an hour upslope winds it makes that much of a difference just because of the sun i mean the, the sun the sun basically creates all that you know that's all a f- function of it again to getting back to the low and high pressure systems like if we have low pressure and it's cloudy like you you're not going to get those slope winds it's going to be it's it's not going to happen you're not going to have as much of an influence over topography when it's overcast. Right. So just to summarize, if we're looking at a stand set up from either like a cyber scouting perspective, or it's the first time hunting there, I should be less concerned with thermals. Let's say under a situation where it's let's go worst case, it's low pressure, a North facing slope and all the vegetation's on, there's going to be a, a lot less thermal effect there. Correct. Well, uh, other than them, them dropping a lot, I think at that point in time, like a lot of your sense is going to be sitting in lower areas. It's just going to be one of those things where you're planning on your scent kind of dropping into the lowest point or if there's water around, you know, a lot of times a stream or a river can have a lot of influence on how things get carried out of there. That can almost act as like a, as a local wind, the direction that a, that a stream's flown, if it's big enough for a river or whatever, that, that can influence some things. Um, but it'll definitely pull or drop you're sent down into those lowest areas at that point in time. So yeah, if you're planning that kind of thing and you have low pressure, it's just going to be kind of one of those things where you're going to rely more on the general winds. But another thing is too, with those in mind, as soon as that sun goes down or goes past the trees, all those general winds and and whatever else kind of go out the window and the thermals start really taking over at that point in time. It's just, you know, whether you're hunting a marsh or you're hunting those hills, those thermals are, are definitely starting to, take over at that point and then later on the evening around prime time for me thermals are more important than the wind is you know because it it always dies out you know it for me it it almost dies out all the time it could be blown 25 miles an hour across the flat train and it seems like you know from near water or something happens where the wind just kind of drops out then i I definitely know one of two things is going to happen if there's water there there's probably a bed on an island or under a single tree or on a hummock or something and I got to set up off, like just kind of off because I know my scent's going to get pulled in there, but I'm just hoping it's not going to get pulled toward that bed. The other thing would be just knowing that my scent's going to pull down around the bottom of my stand if I don't have something that it's going to pull toward. So if I'm sitting closer to a deer trail, like exiting in a bedding area, I want to make sure I might be like a little, like a, not right on top of it, but enough distance where I know like every time I drop my milkweed and we don't have much wind. And if I don't have water, obviously I just watch it drop straight to the ground. So that's let me know that, you know, my scent is pulling right. It's just going to, you know, just pull right at the bottom of my tree and probably spread out closer to the end of the evening. I kind of think about those things a lot, just where I'm at when I don't have the influence of slope and stuff like that. I think um, when you, when you are dealing with slope and, and like I said, we're, it doesn't have to be this big macro thing. It, it happens. These little things happen and aspect is an influence and all these things happen on a much smaller scale than people think. Yeah. I think it's a lot easier to notice on those larger scales, but it, like you said, still occurring on the smaller ones. You know, like when we were talking, you know, when we were talking prior, like when we were setting this up and I was, I was asking you moving from Michigan and moving to Montana and all the time I've spent out West when you see a weather system out there, you you can actually see it moving like a hundred miles away through the landscape and funneling through a valley or doing whatever. I think it's a lot easier to understand when you're at 8,000 feet on a ridgetop somewhere and you're looking over like a, a mountain range and like you'll see a storm split or you'll see, you'll see a thunderstorm develop during the day and, and, or you'll see a front, you know, come through or whatever. It's just, it's, on those macro scales, it's so much easier to see. But most of us aren't, we're not hunting in the West, you know. We're hunting in 
small woodlots near swamps. Like, don't get me wrong, Appalachians, like when I, you know, that's some super steep country. You just don't have the pool, like the length of slope that you would have out west, but it's every bit as steep. Where guys hunting in the hill country in like the Driftless area in western Wisconsin or something like, but the rest of the state's kind of flat, you know. It's having that difference and seeing it more over a macro scale, but I think the micro scale of it is a lot more important. No, that makes a lot of sense. Really good and in-depth explanation there. Appreciate that. Well, we covered slope winds in, in pretty good detail there. Let's move on to what you defined as valley winds. And first, why don't you go ahead and define what a valley wind is or, or how you interpret that? First, a, a valley is just a low piece of land between two hills, you know, usually with a stream or a drainage or a river or something running through it. Again, it can be something that's gigantic or it can be something that's kind of small. But a valley wind is much like they move like the slope winds, but it actually, they kind of occur later in the day. When you have a large area that has a lot of exposure to the sun, like, and especially like, say if you had a ridge system running, again, like west east, and you had, you know, the sun was on the, was really hammering like the south aspect and you had a river down below or whatever, it would kind of start after initially, like, you'd have the upslope winds from the influence of the sun starting to make that rise. Eventually what they're going to start doing is like moving their way up the drainages basically, or up the Valley. So it just kind of occurs later And the, and again, that's a diurnal cycle too. And then in the evening, once the thermal, like once the downslope winds occur, thermal start to drop, all the cold air starts to pull. It just switches again and it starts to drain all the cooler air. Like, it's cooler air starts to drop and in, in down into the valleys. And it's just, it's, it's just another part of that cycle, you know, upslope and downslope. Okay. And then one last definition here, you define something called a transport wind. Explain to us what a transport wind is. So this is something you would normally see like in a normal weather forecast. When I'm planning like for prescribed fire or whatever, I'm writing like a I'm writing a document that has prescriptions and I'm setting like parameters and I'm saying like, I want the humidity to be this and the fuel moisture to be this and, you know, the wind to be this. And, and I want, I want a day where I'm going to have a lot of convective activity. I want an atmosphere that's kind of unstable where all the, I'm going to get a lot of lift. I'm going to get a lot of heating from the sun on the ground. It's going to lift the smoke way up. And then what's going to happen is when it hits the upper atmosphere, there's these upper level winds that are going to push it and, and kind of disperse it. So transport winds aren't something you usually find like on a regular weather forecast. But if you want to get a little bit more in depth and something that will give you a little bit more like, say you're hunting, say you're going to have a front come through. Say you want to know if like there's going to be any weird wind changes or something that's going to occur like a wind switch during the day um noaa has fire weather forecasts and they'll be specific to like your county you're in or whatever and one of the things that'll have in there is transport wind and what a transport is just an upper level wind that is like moving outside oftentimes of the general winds definitely outside of the local winds like i could have a north wind but a westerly transport wind because it's just it's upper upper level winds in the atmosphere they're moving much stronger much faster usually than what they are on the surface level but one thing that I kind of like, if I think I'm going to have a steady general wind, like I, I think I'm going to have a northwest wind and I have a good high pressure system coming through. If I see what my transport winds are like over 15 miles an hour, in my head for me, like based on all the stuff I'm, I'm relying on, I know if it's over 15, the odds of that wind switching from northwest or, or from that wind I've been experience all, experiencing all day is, is very minimal. Like, it's almost like this threshold that you hit. And for me, when I'm like, you know, when I'm lighting stuff on fire, I obviously don't want the wind switching 180 degrees on me because all of a sudden my backing fire turned into a head fire. And my, you know, the flames went from like six inches to like 20 feet. So that's just a little kind of more information that I'm just kind of gathering from the stuff that I use daily to try to help me just get a, get a big picture over maybe what's going to happen in the area with the wind and stuff like that over the course of the day that I'm going to hunt. I, I don't, you know, it's just another tidbit of information. So to recap, if I have a general wind direction in a, a transport wind, that's reinforcing that that's pretty strong. Then I have a high 
chance that the wind's going to remain stable throughout the hunt. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yep. yep. Good, simple way to put it. Yep. Okay. Now I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly because uh, I'm learning here as well. Yep. Well, we've covered like the main types of winds that you discussed, but there's a lot of other factors that can impact weather and wind conditions. And specifically, the two major drivers are temperature and topography. So I'd like, like you to talk about, and you have, you have a little bit, but how the temperature can influence the wind. Yep. So if you have like heating from below or cooling from above, like a lot of times it, it'll increase instability in the atmosphere. So an, an unstable atmosphere, a, a best, the best way to state that is just, is just something that is going to promote convective heating in the atmosphere. So really nice, clear bluebird days with good general winds and good transport winds and good sun exposure basically that's an unstable atmosphere so what that is always going to do is promote lift in the atmosphere so it's always going to cause just as simple as saying air to rise so a really good way to think about that is say trail cameras Um, a lot of us like to use trail cameras so there's two times i'm going to check a trail camera one's going to be when it's pouring down rain if I if I'm putting it in a place where maybe I shouldn't have one in the first place, I want to be able to get in and out clean. The other way I'm going to check it is if it's been super super dry out. We've had really like we've been sitting in a high pressure system where all the vegetation on the ground is really dry. It it has a really high chance of volatilizing my ground scent. So basically the, that heating and that lifting, the sun hitting the ground, it's just basically burning up my ground scent because there's no moisture in the air. So great. So that's the other time I'm going to go look at. The other thing is too, like with instability in the atmosphere, it, like I said, is often associated with high pressure. The other great thing about that is, is that if you have a day where you don't have a really good, you know, general or local wind that is in your favor with the sun hitting the ground again, especially at times during leaf off, basically your ground, your, your, your scent, you know, you're sitting in your tree stand, you're sitting on the ground or whatever, your scent's going straight up in the air. It's a great time to grab that milkweed, kind of let it go and you'll see it just float straight up. So this is one of those funny things where I think uh, this is going to be controversial, but I, I don't really care. Scent eliminating clothing. People swear to God they didn't get winded from that buck because they were wearing their 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 scent eliminating clothing. Well, odds are it was probably like a high pressure day. The wind may they may have thought like the wind was blowing right toward the buck or whatever. You know, it it, my wind was going right toward him. Well, if you have one of those little puffy like bottles full of powder and you spray it, well, how a lot of people use those those wind checkers. Well, what are they good for? Like the first like twenty four inches out of the bottle, right? You have no clue what what your wind is like doing otherwise. It, it's not showing you whether lit, whether the thermals are like you're getting any convective lifting in the atmosphere from the ground heating. It's not showing you any of that stuff. So they're saying they, they had a buck downwind, but if they just had milkweed, they dropped it. They'd see that stuff just float straight up because you're just heating your surfaces and it's, and it's helping you out in that in that aspect. Like you're not it's not spreading your scent all around. Your scent isn't sinking. There isn't moisture in the air. There's nothing, there's no moisture water molecules in the air to hold your scent and have it fall and collect or do anything like that. So that instability is really good. The adverse of that is a stable atmosphere. So stable atmospheres, horrible for what I do for a living when I'm trying to light fires because it it's just basically overcast. It's not a lot of wind. It's zero lifting in the atmosphere. The sun's not even out. It's not heating anything up. It's not doing anything like that. So stable atmospheres are they they carry a certain predictability to them, which is fine. That's great. Like you know, if the sun's not out, probably your biggest influence is just going to be your general or local wind or whatever. But the other thing is, you better be sure. Like if you're setting up somewhere that whatever that direction the wind's blowing, it's not it's not in favor of that animal. You're not going to get away with it that day. It's just not going to happen. But on a, on a high pressure bluebird day with an unstable atmosphere, your scent's getting lifted out there. And just most people don't equate that with the fact that it's an environmental condition that's doing that. That's what's that's why you're not getting scented. It's not it's not your clothes. <laughs> it's not the, the stuff you sprayed on your boots. It's the fact that 
it's just lifting your scent up and out. No, those observations tie in uh, perfectly with what I've experienced. The worst conditions, I think, for me that I can experience is a humid day with an intermittent wind where the you know it's it's light and variable sometimes it blows from the north the east the west and it's humid that just creates in my opinion a giant scent pool around your stand and it's horrible for bow hunting oh yeah i mean if you're trying to get close to something it's not fun so yeah that's just it's just another little kind of thing that enforces you know it's another thing to enforce like and help you uh you know evaluate an area you know and and kind of hey should i go in there that day is it going to be too high risk or is it going to am i going to have a lot of that stuff like eliminated and factoring in whether or not i can get in that spot you know so it's just again it's just another kind of indicator for me or you know lets me kind of feel a little bit more comfortable pushing the situation a little more you know yeah absolutely yeah so the the temperature is a good lead in to the next thing I want to talk about, which is thermals. And thermals are something when I first started bow hunting, I heard the word. I'm going to be completely honest. I had no idea what it meant or how they acted. I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding out there about what a thermal is and the process that drives thermals. And you've covered this in some of your previous answers, but can you tell us uh, exactly how you define a thermal and the mechanics of a thermal? Yeah. So, you know, it's just a column of rising air, you know, in the lower, low, in the lower atmosphere of the earth. So it's like, it's just, a, it's just a form of an atmospheric updraft. That's all it is. It has a lot to do with like, it's the earth gets heated unevenly from, you know, solar radiation. And the reason it's uneven heating, is just because of what's on the ground. Like, you know, if you got a forest with leaf on, obviously it's going to remain a lot cooler than your than your paved driveway when it's got has the sun you know beating down on it well your, your blacktop driveway or say when you're riding down the road like on a long stretch of highway in the desert and you see you know the heat waves kind of rising off you know that's that's the thermal column um you know taking off and then without the in- influence of the sun you know it's also cooling on evenly as well great example is water it takes a really long time for water to like heat and cool it doesn't it, it's a much slower rate than you know the the ground so that has a huge influence on how thermals are going to act and and things like that but yeah it's just a column it's just basically a column of of rising air great example of thermals is just in relation to the earth's surface being heated is like watching turkey buzzards out in the field and just you'll see them you'll see a big group of them hitting that thermal uh same with like a hang glider somebody hang gliding or whatever you know you just see their wings locked and going in this circular motion just going on this updraft and they're getting higher and higher but they're not even flapping their wings now it's a great example and you'll see a buzzard you know get so high sometimes it's just a black speck you can't even believe it got that high but it'll be on the day where there's a lot of solar input and a lot of convective, a big convective current happening and that rise in just a huge, you know, a huge column of warm air rising up into the atmosphere. So that's basically what a thermal is. When we talk, talk about a switch or a thermal, when we say the thermals are dropping, it's, yeah, it's kind of a misnomer because it's basically the thermals going away. It's no longer a thermal. So it's almost like there's no more thermal. So we just say, oh, the thermals are dropping, but it's actually just, it's just, you know, it's just dissipating. It's just that warm air settling back to that low pocket you described earlier. Yep. And like we said, you know, cold air is heavy and it falls. And then, you know, warm air rises. That's just, just how it works. And that cold air is always going to follow that lowest area. So that's, that's what I define as a thermal. Yeah. And I think that's a really important concept for bow hunters specifically. I think going back to my own hunting experience, level one wind understanding is general wind right and then maybe from a general wind you you go to the certain spot that you hunt and you realize oh on on this general wind i actually have a different local wind and then from there you graduate from well now i know there's general and local winds and those can be different to now i gotta factor in 
how does the thermal in this area act? And you touched on a lot of important factors. What's the aspect? Which way is the slope facing? You know, and, and how is that going to influence the wind? So there's kind of like, at least to me, there's tiers of understanding. And that's what I want this whole podcast to be about is, is to help people get to a higher tier understanding of what can influence the wind in their hunting area. Yeah, a- absolutely. It's so it's so intermingled and you don't have one without the other. That's grasping it and figuring it out is like, is it, it, I think that's what bumps you up into the next level, you know? Well, one of the other big influences on thermals can be standing bodies of water, or water in general, but but even more specifically, or they have a bigger effect, standing bodies of water. And we've talked about this previously, but why don't you describe your experience with standing bodies of water and, and how those can influence the thermals? Yeah, it's, man, it's, they can drive you crazy sometimes, but then it, in, in the same, in the same, you know, time, they can, they can be your friend with me hunting around marshes a lot or hunting around swampy areas and, and not having a lot of topography. Like these are really important. And, and the other thing is too, is the time of year, their influence has changed in the time of the year or, t- or more so the time of day. If you have warm water around you, like if it's early season, it's still creating lift, even though, and this goes back again to the uneven, you know, heating and cooling of the earth's surface. We already said, you know, water takes a lot longer to, to hit equilibrium or, or to just change temperature. You can have a huge swing in your, in your, in your temperature, huge temperature drop, but the water, you know, it could be 30 degrees or 40 degrees and the water can still be 60 degrees. You get a 30 degree difference between the two with the water being warmer. We know that cool air likes to go to warm air. Same way that we talked about, you know, high pressure systems following low pressures. We got warmer air and we got colder air behind it. They, they want to follow each other. It's, it's weird. So that cooler air, you know, a lot of times it wants to hit that rising you know, column again, but that, that water is going to remain even sometimes at night, um, having some sort of lift it's because it's still creating heating. So it's going to pull everything in around it. And then the adverse of that is, is like if the water's cooler and the ground's warmer in the evenings that the, your air, your thermal, your, your dissipating thermal and the cooler air always wants to go toward the lowest, coolest spot. So my experience with it going back to, again, like we have pretty big marshes around here on the coast and they, and they're not cattail marshes or their marshes are full of phragmites. And that's just this giant reed grass. And it, it's an invasive species actually. And it, the stuff can get, you know, 15 feet tall and like dog hair thick. Yeah. Those things are everywhere in Michigan. Now they're taking over all the cattail marshes. They're horrible. Yeah. And it's like our normal marshes would be like Spartina grass, which is like this low, like kind of salt grass and, you could see across the marshes, but then you'd also have like trees and stuff intermingled with them. The other, the other issue we're running into these days is like, we're, we're dealing a lot with sea level rise and we're getting salt water coming further up into the, into the land masses and they're, and they're killing all the trees and you'll find a deer trail. You look in aerial photos and stuff like that. And you'll see these trails going through the frag, much like you would cat cattails or anything like that, you know, going from spokes, you know, on a wheel, like Dan, would always talk about you know coming into a certain area and you can see those trails well you know there's no way to find out what's going on unless you put your boots on and you go walk through that stuff like first thing you want to do is like maybe put some glasses on like so you don't lose your eye (laughs) and then and not only that but where you step so that that the frag is weird because it 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 occurs from these rhizomes which are like these big roots underground and it actually destabilizes the marsh So they, when they rot or they do whatever, it leaves all these hollow pockets in the ground and it just makes this gnarly black mud that it's, I've been up to my armpits in it before looking for a buck that I had a bad hit on. I just sunk on time and I thought I was going to have to get a helicopter to pull me out. Like, I'm not joking. You're following these trails out and then all you're finding is like a single tree. So, and if the root mass is big enough, guarantee there's a bed under there. And the one thing about those things is they're not necessarily, they're not wind-based beds at all. They're any wind direction beds because those, those deer know that they're not going to see where what's coming at them. They might hear it, but they're definitely going to smell it because it's situated in a way that 
you kind of have to, you can't necessarily get back in there and cut a path in there to try to shoot an exit trail or whatever. It'd be impossible. It's, it'd just be so hard to do. And you're not going to do that on public land anyhow, but so you're having to, you're having to hunt kind of like having to hunt, having to hunt the transition, like where the, it's usually like bottomland hardwoods. It'd be like a flooded swamp or, you know, wetter area that all of a sudden has a pretty hard transition and you're hunting that exit trail. Well, that buck's better there or whatever, because every night when the sun goes down, those thermals are pulling everything from the outside right to them, right down his trail, whatever. So you're, you're having to learn how to hunt like maybe further off, further down that transition line. And you're, and you're hoping basically that your scent is just skirting him. So you're definitely doing, you're hunting off winds all the time down here when you're hunting in the marsh. It's because at night it's going to go right toward the water or right toward that bed there. I mean, it's definitely there for a reason. And there was a little thread a little bit ago um, on the beast and the, a couple guys that I know that work for Delaware. And then they did the study on like, they did that buck study. They collared them and they started talking about the mature bucks, like going into these, these areas where they're basically not bothered at all. Well, first of all, nobody wants to go in there after them, but they're basically creating bulletproof bedding for themselves because of the thermal influence of that water and how it's pulling down into those areas at night. It's just, it makes it really hard to get a crack at them. And oftentimes too, it's really weird. I've found when I'm hunting those areas too, is the does a lot of times are bedded right on that transition line. So you're sneaking in all quiet. And the next thing you know, you bump like a whole bunch of does. And then you hear something like back in the marsh where the bed is like dive into the water. It sounds like a cannonball hitting the water. And you're <laughs> like, Oh, well, there he was. I had that happen a lot uh, when I first started dealing with the marsh and the water and then realizing how strong those thermals started pulling. And again, that was just a milkweed thing where I'm sitting and I had the wind in my face blowing from the bed to me. And then the next thing you know, the sun goes down and it's just like, I mean, it's so abrupt. It's, the switch just goes off and then all of a sudden the milkweed just starts pulling 180 degrees right down toward the water or toward the bed or whatever so that was one of the biggest things like i've i had to learn and what the water influence um another really cool scenario i had happen one time dan had a cool video about this a couple years back early on where he was sitting around a pond and he was throwing milkweed and was basically sucking the milkweed into the pond because the water was was warmer and it was it was taking it and sucking it straight up well this was prior to me seeing it it was just like a better explanation for it later on and I had this one area that had a pond, a really small pond in the middle of this pine plantation that we had thinned. So like they came in and mechanically thinned it, spaced out the trees. Um, and then we went in there and burned it or whatever. But, uh, after we burned it, like we got what's called basically like pine grass. So just all these pine trees just regenerated in there and got super, super thick. And when you're down on the ground, like you're struggling to get through this stuff to get to where you want to hunt. And I had one tree in particular that I had over the pond. It was like one of those surefire early season spots. If I wanted to kill a doe early and like fill up my freezer, I was going there like every time. Because our early season, like September 1st, it, the humidity is, first of all, it's brutal. It's it's like up in the upper 80s, it can be 90% humidity. It can be 90 degrees out. You're like in you're, you're factoring all these crazy things. You're like, one of them is, is okay. If I kill something, how quick can I get it out of here right. and get it cooled down, whatever. But it's also a great time to get a crack at a buck because that there was a field close by. It was thick enough that they could bed in that, in that, that all that pine regen swing by that pond for a drink before they headed out. Like it's a great spot. So there was a set of train tracks that ran parallel to it. And a lot of times it was easier for me to like walk up the tracks and then just dip down one of the thinning rows and cut in and, and kind of and hook around and, and get set up in this tree. And, um, I was, was walking up the train tracks one day to it. And I had, um, I had a North, like North, Northwest wind. It was like blown right in my face, but there was a giant buck bedded right off the train tracks. Like, he was in this like super thick, like little spot and he wasn't 15 yards off the tracks. Oh, wow. 
And well, a lot of hunters that hunt that piece of public land, especially during gun season and stuff, that's the first thing they do is they walk up those tracks and they cut in. So I was like, this guy, like he's got going on, like he knows exactly what he's doing. So I bumped that buck. And then it was one of those things where I was like, well, maybe I'll just take another crack at him. I'll come in a different way. I waited for like a North Northeast wind. It was just maybe like maybe 30, 40 degree difference to get to the pond. I had to walk through that region. It was, it was brutal and had to get to the tree and I got set up and sure enough, like probably 25 minutes left the shooting light. I was looking over in the direction where that buck was better. And I watched him get up and I was like, I was blown away. He got up and he started making his way and he did a huge hook, like huge downwind hook to get on the, on the downwind side of this pond. And he went right behind me. And I thought for sure I was going to get picked hard. Like I, like the way the, the way the wind was North Northeast wind blown, like right past me, right to him. He walked around me. And the crazy thing about this hunting, these pines was you can't see anything on the ground, but once you got up in the tree, I'd get like four sticks high. I was almost like, you know, 22, 25 feet. Once you got up there, you could start seeing these little pockets and, and start, picking the place apart it was way easier it was you know all your shot opportunities open up everything was good he walked downwind of me downwind of the pond and he bedded with the windows back with a bunch of thick stuff behind him and he was looking out in the direction basically where i came in at the trail that basically i walked or i didn't really walk down a trail but the direction that i came in at okay and he sat there and i'm sitting there like trying to figure out like how i'm not getting winded right now and this is really prior to like a lot of my equating the thermals with, and using it for hunting rather than, you know, what I'm using it for in my career or whatever. And I had the milkweed, I dropped the milkweed. And then just in that little sphere of that pond I was in, it just sucked that milkweed right toward the water. And it dipped down and it hit that lift, that column from that warmer water. The, the, at the time, the water was warmer than the outside air. And it just shot it straight up in the air. So I was like, wow, this is, you know, I'm basically, I'm not getting winded. This thermal's pulling my scent into this pond. It, it was awesome. Like, I, and, and I, that buck eventually got up and he circled around and he started coming in and I, I actually ended up getting picked off. I didn't get a crack at him, but, um, it was a really cool lesson. It was really cool being able to go back there. Like, you know, a week and a half or two weeks later and still seeing that same deer after he got bumped. But it was one of those things, too, where that bed worked for him, so why not use it again? You know what I mean? Right. That was really a cool, like, water example. A negative one I had, and I I really don't like hunting in the mornings. I, I especially around water, I can't stand it because I just, it, it never works for me. I had a, a little private farm that I was able to hunt for a couple years. It was a landowner that I did have some work for, and he asked me if I like to hunt, and I, I hunt very little. I barely ever hunt private and it was like i had this little stretch 99 percent of the time i'm on public but yeah this really cool like 160 acre block of woods gave me sole permission to hunt it It had giant bucks on it i ended up shoulder shooting like 160 inch 10 pointer on there and losing it it was like no, a heartbreaker no. but the, these are the kind of deer that were on this place like it was completely unpressured but it was completely open hardwoods and it was so difficult to access and like hunt and, but it had a couple patches of frag, like one acre patches, like grown right in the middle of it. And those things were like magnets, but then it had a branch, like a Creek that ran the outer edge of it. But I had a big elevation drop there, like 15 or 20 feet. And I, everybody will laugh that'll listen to this, but for me, that's huge. And I'll tell you right now, even with that small of a elevation change in that slope, those deer did the same exact thing. Every time they have that trail in the upper third. They use it the same exact way. They use the thermals the same. They do, they travel in that safe, like little tunnel, you know, and this is again, going down to that micro thing that I'm talking about, like micro landscape type thing. Well, I, I wanted to try to catch a buck back coming from the fields, going back to bedding. There was a flooded bedding area behind me. It was down in there. It was all these big pines on hummocks. It was like, if you stepped in the, if you try to get back in there, you, you sunk up to your you know, up to your waist, but that, that was like their bulletproof spot. And I was really hoping to catch one on the way back. Well, I got in there early morning 
And what I found out was, is that all that cold air and everything pulled into the water, pulled into that super low spot. And it was, it was so dense in there that it was actually kind of like creating like an outflow. And it was, it, it was doing the opposite of pulling my scent in. It was actually pushing it out into the woods in the direction that that buck would have been coming back to bedding. It just, it, and that, this was late season, winter time, no leaves, no nothing in super cold morning. And it could have been one of those times where the outside, the ambient air temperature in the woods was colder than what the water was. It was actually pulling the, it was pulling everything in rather than going out. And it took, you know, it took till like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning for the sun to have enough influence where I started like pulling, like picking my scent up straight up. It, I mean, by that time the, the hunt was shot, right. everything was shot, but I just sat there and froze all morning just to kind of see how long it would take, you know, until things switched. And it took a really long time. And from that point on, like, I was like, it's, it's useless for me to try to hunt around these areas in late season or winter when it's cold, it just didn't make any sense. So that was where the water actually pushed the air away, pushed the, the air current away without any influence from a local or a general wind because there was no sun, there was no anything. You know, I got that in there, the crack of like an hour before sun up or whatever. Yeah, it's almost the same effect we talked about earlier, like a high humidity day with light and variable winds. It's just it's just pooling, making a big pool of ground level. And if there and if there's frost on the ground, the reason there's frost on the ground is because, you know, it was all that that, you know, all the moisture in the air condensed and you know, froze. So yeah, it's a moist, humid air. Even though during the day it's gonna be unstable and the air is gonna be drier and all that stuff. It's just, you know, the mornings are tough for that reason. So especially around water for me, I just I kind of just gave up on it. Those are important facts to consider if you're doing your preseason scouting and you find what looks like a, a super hot area and there's water nearby. Well, something you might want to consider is maybe evening hunt or uh, maybe a morning hunt is out of the question and evening hunts the way to go. Yeah. And anything I've been dealing with, like from a predictability standpoint, like from, you know, there's thermals dissipating and pulling toward the water, doing whatever, it's just so much easier to figure out in the evening. And it's just, and that's going to be your best shot. Anyhow, is just trying to, you know, get that, you know, that buck coming out of bedding. Yeah. I think these concepts are kind of that next tier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Over the years, it's, that's, what's been giving me the edge for sure. You know, it's just taking all that, you know, first of all, getting out there and learning the hard way, failing and failing and failing and failing. And then, and then taking all those other things and then that just using that as a way to just check things off the list and eliminate, you know, bad decisions in timing, you know, because you can waste your whole hunting season real easy, like, and sit somewhere and not see deer all season. Like, I mean, great, but who wants to do that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Nobody wants to. I know I've done it a few times. Yeah, I know. I, I like eating medicine. That's all I know. Right. <laughs> Now, those are great examples, though, of how to look at a body of water and, you know, take into account for the air temperature and kind of plan your hunt and being able to rely on that, like you said, in the evening, maybe that thermal vacuum or in the morning, avoid that thermal, for lack of a better term, fan where that, that water is pushing the air out away from your location. Yeah, another weird thing we deal with around here, too, but it's more early season is like, and, and most people don't deal with it unless they're on the coast of sea breeze. So like you can have a great offshore flow, like, you know, early in the morning where you have a good general wind, like blowing out of the Northwest. And if the ocean temperature varies from, you know, the land temperature and you're close, you're within that like eight, 10 mile, like strip of, of coast, it, like that wind switches, it starts coming off the water blowing really hard. So you, uh, you, you get an East wind. And that's another thing that we deal with too, especially if I'm hunting in the marshes, like the tidal marshes, like out, you know, closer to where I live. It's just, if you have a sea breeze, man, you're just, it's really screwy. Yeah. It's so many variables to consider as a bow hunter. Yep. Speaking of variables, and we discussed this briefly earlier, but I think it's real important and worth mentioning. You kind of touched on it when you were talking about checking your trail cameras 
And this is something that might not come to mind for a lot of hunters is how humidity affects scenting conditions. So what's your opinion on humidity, uh, how it affects wind and, and the scenting behavior of deer? One thing I always think about, like, you know, people don't know how well deer smell. It's just, it's crazy how that olfactory system works. It's so out there because they rely on it so heavily. And we, like, say you smell pizza, you know, you smell a pizza and you're like, oh, that smells like pizza. You know, but that deer smells, that deer smells the flour. The deer smells the salt. Their noses just break everything down into these little separate elements. So, like, if you're if you're thinking you're masking your human scent, it's like that ain't happening because he that deer just picks it apart too easy. But I like I like having dogs. Like I had a pointer. I got a German short hair pointer, and she she's a really cool dog. And she was in the woods with me every day for I don't know until she couldn't be in the woods anymore. So probably a good solid 11, 12 years. Um, and we don't have quail around much anymore, but we, we still have woodcock and stuff like that. And they occupy like, you know, the flooded areas around us. And, and I had that dog trained also to shed hunt in the blood trail. I wanted to have like this all purpose animal. And I really like woodcock are easy for those dogs because they they really smell like some dogs don't even like putting them in their mouth but the scent is so strong on them so with certain days like i loved hunting overcast days where there's a lot of you know like humidity in the air because the dog could just pick them up like sometimes we get into a place where like the the smell would be so overwhelming that the dog would go on point and the bird wouldn't even be around like <laughs> the bird might be 50 yards away and it was just because all that scent was getting pulled down into that. It was, it'd be a wetter day, stable atmosphere again, like overcast, holding all that humidity. Um, and that, that bird was just putting off a massive scent cone. But then, then, then there's days where it's high pressure, a lot of thermal lift, a lot of convective lifting from the sun, super dry vegetation, whatever. You know, the dog would just have a terrible time sometimes trying to find something as well as she could smell. I mean, it was amazing what she could do. And especially like think about, you know, dog finding a shed antler or whatever, roaming on a huge flat piece of ground. I mean, she's covering a lot of ground, obviously, but that what that dog's really picking up on isn't so much the antler itself early season. They're picking up on that wax. That's like at the base of the antler, you know, when you get a fresh shed and it's got that that wax with like the hair in it. Yep. That's what the dogs like, that's what a good shed dog smelling. And then, and then outside of that, that dog's looking for that form of the antler, like times up, times down, whatever. But that, that, the atmosphere conditions had so much of an influence on, you know, how the day was going to go and knowing how dog, well, that dog could smell. I forget how many times better a deer can smell than a dog, but it's like, it doesn't even compare. So tracking dogs and stuff can pick up scent from what? a week or days or, and from how many miles, like somebody traveled and a deer can smell that much better. So there's atmosphere conditions, you know, they're going to use them to their favor, you know, pr to protect themselves as much as they can. So that's where those atmosphere conditions definitely influence like scenting conditions for sure. And I think the takeaway for me or for, for bow hunters in general should be if you've got those marginal conditions where you've got, moisture on the ground or high humidity or light and variable winds maybe those are the days you hold off from your best spots and you wait for that high pressure steady wind days yeah for sure i mean it's just yeah i mean you gotta you gotta be thinking about that you know you have to be thinking about like if you see a place where the sign opened up and you know like you have a known bedding area and maybe you have history with a place where you've seen you know several really good bucks come out of that area you know, over the years or, or watch them, observe them and watch them get up and do whatever. Like, yeah, those aren't the, those aren't the, I don't think those are the places you're going to, you're going to want to go on haphazardly because that might be that one sit you get that year for that spot, you know, and you're definitely, or you might not sit it at all because you might not get the right kind of scenario that year, you know, pushing it's great. I mean, pushing it, it definitely is going to get you, you know, but it's high risk, high reward, you know what I mean? So absolutely. Well, Eric, I think that wraps up all the questions I had for you. Got any final thoughts here before we cut you loose? Not anything in particular, but, you know, if anybody um, has any questions after this, 
I know there's been threads, you know, as a result of uh, your previous podcast. So I know some guys fielded some questions when I posted some things. I think I, I, I gave them some explanations and if there's other, other, I mean, there's a lot of other weather stuff out there that, you know, I didn't even touch on, but I think generally overall, I think this will give you a good, you know, understanding, but nothing is going to make up for experience in getting out there and, and like testing these concepts and stuff like that. You know, you got to take a few to make a few. It's just the way it goes. I always say there's no replacement for experience, but it's great to understand this from a conceptual point of view. Yeah. And a lot, in a lot of this stuff, like, you know, all this information or whatever, it's, it's all out there and available. It's, it's readily available, you know, to kind of recap and touch on, um, you know, on the computer or whatever. And if you want even a more detailed explanation or whatever, but I think it's great going on a site and reading about some of these kill or doing whatever, it's really cool after the fact, like when guys put maps up and they talk about what things were, where they were at, you know, there's a reason why that deer was there. There's a reason it might be a surprise to them, but the cool thing is, is if you can start eliminating the surprises or, or, you know, kind of be in a scenario where maybe you got, you thought you got lucky. Well, maybe those influences were in your favor. You just didn't know. And the other thing is too, is like, What's so impressive to me is there's a lot of guys on the beast that, you know, they do a lot of traveling, they'll hit a lot of states, you know, they'll kill multiple bucks a year in different places in, in, a, in a time frame of like, you know, five or six days. And look at somebody like Ridge Runner, you look at even Dan and Joe and all the THP guys and they're traveling all over the place and they're, and they're doing and they're, they're doing these hunts. Tyler had a really good like he had a really good season, whatever that he had taped last year, I thought was really cool. Him, him hunting in the hills. I think having this background and knowledge and especially like this weather stuff and all these other little things it's one thing like finding sign it's one thing picking a place out but all this like having this this knowledge helps you eliminate all these variables and help you like pinpoint a spot i those guys do so well killing is because they're processing those things in in your mind so fast you, you're you're considering all the variables at a very fast rate when you're trying to hunt a new spot or 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 things change and the guys that are really good are the ones that have that ability to quickly adapt to recognize those conditions that they're going to find in their favor in that spot that can get them in range to you know get a crack and that and and that's what i think like this is a big part of it and this is a lot of what was a turning point for me it was a one thing like going out and finding buck beds and stuff for the first time but when you, you got to start asking your question, the questions, why it's there, why that buck bedded there, when and how, and it's, it all has to do with these, all of it has to do with these atmospheric conditions and how it's going to use it in its favor, like a hundred percent. That's a great point. And it's funny when I found the hunting beast initially, I thought finding the bed was the end, right? Oh, me too, man. Me too. I was like, there's the bed. I'm going to go hunt it. Not even close. Right. Turns out finding the bed's just the beginning. That is a hundred percent the beginning. And then you gotta, then you gotta sit there and like, you know, is this a rep bed? Is this a primary bed? Is this, what you know, and then you, it's even picking all those nuances apart. Time of the year obviously has a huge influence on things. Pressure, huge thing, but I, those deer are going to try to, they're, they're adjusting to that pressure, putting themselves in a situation where all those conditions are in favor, where they basically eliminate any human contact and they don't want to make a mistake. And, say it over and over again there's huge difference between well there's a huge difference between a deer on public and a deer on private and then you know where i hunt a spike buck is trying to pick you off in the trees and if you're starting to kill like you know four-year-old bucks and you're doing pretty good like i want to come talk to you like (laughs) right (laughs) and i've had guys like i have a couple people that i keep in contact and that I initially met on the beast and it might have been like years ago that I've come down and, and hunted public land that, that I manage or whatever, even though I, even though I manage a big piece of land, I don't have any distinct advantages over anybody else. I don't, I can't I, like, I have general idea. It, it, and it, and the other thing is too, is nothing ever makes up for hard work. I, I do not have places where I can go in every year and consistently kill something. It, it's all, it all relies on the sign that's there. And every single time I go into a place, I have to pick it apart every single time. 
there's no slam dunks, there's no anything like that. And I put tons of time in with scouting and thinking about things and adjusting and do, and it, it's it all the the more work you put in and then backed with like being able to pick up nuances and new knowledge that are going to help you eliminate factors that are going to work against you, like keep at it. And I, I think that's why it's so easy for people to get frustrated and walk away from the style of hunting so quick. They're so quick to like dump money into equipment, like get all this stuff and then go out and find out, Hey man, this isn't for me. And I think as quickly as they come that they, they fall just as quick if they don't see success right away and you're not going to you're not gonna like it and i feel like sometimes i feel like i'm just starting to scratch the surface on things and i think a lot of us like feel that way too but it's the work and and when you're trying to balance family and you're trying to balance your job and you're trying to do all i can understand how it's hard for a guy to like get into this it requires a lot of dedication it requires a lot of passion but it it's also really rewarding it's cool getting together and talking to someone like you who kind of understands that mindset and like, and moving on from there and continue learning. You're, you always have to be a student. You, like if you refuse to be a student and you start, you start getting locked in this mindset that this is the way you do things. I'm telling you what, man, I'm, I'm, you're not going to continue and be happy with what you're doing. And the other thing too, man, is it needs to be fun. Like if it's not fun anymore, and you're walking away PO'd every time you walk in the woods and you don't see something or kill something like this is not for you at all. So I, I just kind of mark it up as like, there's certain times of the year where it becomes a lifestyle for me. Like I I'm thinking about it a lot and I'm, and after I kill a good one, I'm not, I'm always moving on to the next one, man. And that's the thing is you're always moving on and every scenario is different. And that's where the challenge of it. I love that sometimes for me, like the harder the better. So but having armed with knowledge and other people's experience and like that free knowledge sharing that happens on a place like the beast, that's so rare. And to have people stoked for you that you're doing as well as they are and killing to your own public land and whatever. That's awesome. You know, I love passing that along. Definitely good community. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really cool. And I just hope that, you know, everybody can kind of walk away from listening to this if they take the time and just, and hopefully a light bulb goes off and just consider other factors that, that may help them in their, in their quest here to, to, to do well and be satisfied and, and killing something isn't always the satisfaction. And I know, you know, that the experience is the journey's so much better than the, the destination for me so many times. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, and, and just that experience, like you got one life to live, man. So you got to go out and live it. And if you like to hunt, like, you know, there's no more of a challenge in getting out on public land and, and, and knocking down a good one and something that you're happy with. As long as that deer, when you see it lights you up and you get your heart starts racing and it makes you want to draw your bow back or whatever, that's good enough deer as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. There's a lot more to a trophy than uh, inches of antler. That's for sure. Yeah, man. Yep. And it doesn't matter how much you cook that antler, you still can't eat it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, Eric, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to call in tonight and talk to me. Yeah, Jeremy, it was really great. I really appreciate it. Like, you know, and it, when we first, you know, started talking about this, it's been a little bit of a time. And uh, I wish you continued success. I really enjoyed the other podcasts you had on and listening to the other, everybody else's perspective and experience and kind of stories and stuff like that. And it's, it, it's cool. There's people among us that are there's always somebody out there that's, you know, going after it and putting the time in and finding that way to balance it, you know, balance that with, with every, everything else that got going on. And I, I appreciate that with everybody too, taking their time to do things like this and talk with you. So I, I hope they, they uh, regard, you know, my time as the same. Yeah, for sure. Thanks again. I think we'll wrap it up there for today and good luck this season. I'm sure we'll be following along. Yeah, just scouting now and turkeys are coming up and then fishing and then kind of all starts all over again. And I'm, as soon as deer season's over, I'm ready for it all over again. So. All right. All right, man. Well, hey, thanks again and take care. Yeah, man. Talk to you soon. See you, bud. Later. Yeah, bye.